Hello Believe Nation, I started the Mentor Me series with the goal to try to hang around people who've done a lot more than us and by sticking with them a little bit longer, hopefully some of their ideas, their strategy, their mindsets, their belief seeps into us to help us become the best version of ourselves. So today we're gonna learn from Tony Robbins and examine some of his best motivational clips that he posted in 2016 as an incentive for you to go for your best this year. Mentor me, Tony. Clip number one is my personal favorite, and as always, guys, as Tony's talking, if he says something that really, really, really resonates with you, please leave in the comments below, put quotes around it, so other people can be inspired as well. Enjoy. The number one thing that's gonna change your life, the only thing that will change your life, change your business, change your money, change your relationship, is you must raise your standard. Now I know that sounds boring, stupid, basic, but it's the truth. The only thing that changes our life long term is when we raise our standards. What does that mean? That sounds so boring and dumb. It means that all of us in life have things we want. We don't get what we want. We get what we have to have. Remember I said earlier, we all get what we tolerate in ourselves and other people. But when you're no longer willing to tolerate something, that's when your life changes. The difference in people is their standards, period. The difference in people is their standards, period. And what do I mean by standards? Everyone in the world has a list of things they think they should do. I should lose weight. I should work out. I should spend more time with my kids. I should work harder. I should make more calls. I should, I should, I should, I should. And then you know what? People don't do their shoulds and they get mad at themselves and they what I call shit all over themselves. They beat themselves up about it. What changes people is when your should becomes a must. When suddenly the thing you said should happen has to happen. That's when human beings change. It's like if you want to take the island and you're the head of the army and you want to take the island, the most powerful way to take the island is burn the boats. Because if there's no way to go back, it's amazing what happens when it's a must to do something versus a should. That's what makes human beings succeed. There is another level. The only reason you keep saying there isn't is you feel so exhausted about where you are. But life, the universe, or God is just testing you because there is another level. If this is good, giant jump to excellence, giant jump, good, poor to good to excellence, there's a level where all your dreams are realized. There's a level that you've always dreamed about. It is real. It has not gone away. But it takes that extra burst when you think there's nothing left. There's no way. You've tried everything 10 million times and you keep going. It's almost like God is saying, if you keep hitting this wall enough times, I will see that you will not stop, that you are filled with that level of determination, faith, and courage, and then the door opens and you get to that next level. But what most people don't know is the next level is just two millimeters above. And it's called outstanding, ladies and gentlemen, outstanding. What's it called? What's it called? What's it called? Outstanding, magnificent, unstoppable, extraordinary, not excellent. It's a different level. It's a level where you are not one of the best, you are the best. And you know what's amazing? You only have to be two million years more than everybody else and you get everything. You get the joy, the laughter, the fun, the family, the passion, the economics, the freedom, the spirit, it's all there. What Jerry Maguire called the Quan, baby, all of it. And it's just two million years above and most excellent people give up because they're exhausted. And there's some people who go, the harder I hit it, the more I hit it, sooner or later it's going down, I'm not stopping. And when you do that enough, it pops open. What makes you a leader is your ability to make a decision. Who's with me on this, right? And anybody can make the easy decision, right? So what makes you a leader is you can make the tough decisions. And what makes you a leader is you make the decision. What makes you a great leader is you know, I may be wrong, but if I have to wait till everything's resolved, nothing's gonna get resolved. 
So I'm gonna make a decision. If I make a decision and it's wrong, I'll find out quicker than if I sit on the fence while my life goes by. I remember, I, I, I've shared this with maybe a few of you before, but uh, years and years ago when we had the big Gulf War, General you know, uh, Norman Schwarzkopf's a friend of mine, who passed away a few years ago, and I used to bring him in to talk about leadership. And one of the first times I ever asked him, I said, how do you define leadership? You know, how do you know when a person's really a leader? And he said, when they can make decisions. And he said, I can remember when I was, he was an assistant to a, to a general, and I forget what the exact position is, but he said he was responsible for reading all the briefs. And this general is one of the highest generals in the army, and there was a decision that needed to be made It had to do with 10 years of going back and forth with the Pentagon, trying to figure out if they're gonna make a go one direction or another. It was a gigantic decision that was gonna affect the way the army was structured, how money was gonna be divided, what resources are gonna go where. And he said, they brought in this group of 20 people in and they had this two hour meeting and everybody got up and pitched their side of what they thought was right. And at the end, when it was completely done, the general said, has everyone said their piece? He said, yes. He said, do this. It was plan A or plan B, whatever it was, out of the three choices they had. And everybody said, okay, okay, General, you know, saluted him and ran off to go implement this thing. And, and Schwarzkopf said he was freaking out because he knew there's no way that General could have read everything even he'd read. And this was such a complex piece and there was only two hours and everybody gave their best, but oh my God, there's so many things to consider. And so he finally he got up enough courage, he said, to go to the General and said, General, so he said, permission to speak freely. He said, ease, speak freely. He said, General, there is so much information here and there's so much here and no one's really gonna know for sure. How the hell could you just make that decision like that? He said, because someone had to make it. He said, because it's been going around for 10 years back and forth and no one being able to make a decision. He said, what if you're wrong? He said, if I'm wrong, we'll find out quicker. And if I'm right, the job will be done. Next question, right? It's like when you're put in charge, take command. Everyone in this room knows how to create. You're not a manager of your life, you're a creator of your life or you wouldn't be in this room. How do you create your life? You get hungry for something, don't you? Who has done something in your life that once seemed difficult or impossible and now it's part of your life? Who's got something in your life in this area? Say I. How did you do it? You created it three ways. Number one, you decided there's something you wanted so bad that you unleashed all your desire. You became obsessed with it. If it was a business or a car or a relationship or a transformation in your body, if there's something you once envisioned and now it's real, it's because you didn't just envision it, you brought so much emotion to it that now it's in your life. It was once a dream, it was once a goal, and now it's in your life. How many have something like that in your life now? Say I. You may take it for granted now, hopefully not, but it was once just a vision. It may have seemed impossible at one time, so how did you do it? You started with a concrete vision of what you wanted and you focused on it continuously, didn't you? Wherever focus goes, energy flows. You envisioned something, you got clear about it, and then you started thinking about all the reasons why you wanted it. You got excited about it. Said, this is what's next for me now. I want this. You may have dreamed about it, thought about it, talked about it. But when you focus on something continuously, something magical happens. You get insights, don't you? You overhear a conversation and you hear something you wouldn't have heard if you didn't have that outcome or goal that you wanted so badly. Who's ever come up with something, obsessed about it, didn't even know how to do it, and it just happened and it came together? Who's had that experience? Say, I. So why don't we tap into that power now for your business and life? There was a day that I became wealthy. I'll tell you the day, I know that day I was rich. I was broke, I was pissed, I was angry at everybody else but who? Myself, but really underneath it, I was mad at myself, I just couldn't beat myself up anymore, so I was pissed and I had a friend that I loaned money to when I had barely enough and I knew he needed it and I gave him $1,200 and I'm here not able to eat, I'm down to like $25, $26 and I'm saying to him, calling him and he's not returning my call and I just need some money and he's ignoring me. I didn't ignore him then, so I'm pissed, I'm frustrated. In the midst of all this, I'm also pragmatic. I got 25 and change, call it $26. What the hell am I gonna do? I don't have any plans for economics. I got overhead that's crazy. 
I'm living in this little tiny apartment, 400 square feet in Venice, California. So I thought, okay, when I was totally broke early on when I was 17, I used to save my money up and go to the smorgasbord and load up for Christmas, you know, load up for the week. So I said, I was in Venice. I'm going to go over to Marina del Rey where all the yachts are and there's a place there called El Torito and I'm going to go. They have an all-you-can-eat smorgasbord. I'm going to load up for the winter. I'm going to get there. So I didn't drive there because I wasn't going to spend the gas to get there. Plus, I needed the walk, so I walked there. And I go in, I'm not dressed really great, but it's Marina del Rey, it's okay. And I got a place right by the window and I can see these yachts going by and I'm dreaming of what life could be like and I'm starting to le let go of my anger and I'm starting to start focus on what I want instead of what I don't want. How many followers say I? And that shifted me just a bit. And now I'm eating, which shifted me a lot. And I got this giant plate stacked up and I don't know what the amount was, it was like whatever it was, 695, 795, right? So. I'm gonna do this, I could probably do this three or four times, right? Somewhere in that range. As I'm finishing my meal, this little boy comes in, dressed in a little suit, and I honestly don't know how old he'd be, probably in the third grade, so maybe eight years old, nine years old, something like that. And he was so adorable, and he opened the door for his mother, and his mother was an attractive lady, and he came over and he pulled out the seat for her, and she sat down, and I was, she was a pretty lady, but as pretty as she was, I was totally obsessed by this boy. He was just, he had presence at seven or eight years old. And it moved me. I don't know why, just it moved me. And I thought, this kid is like pure. He's, I want him to always be this way. He's such a good kid. He's a giver. So I got up and I paid for the meal. And whatever it was, six, seven bucks. So now I've got whatever left, 17, 18, 19 dollars. And I walk up to this little boy and I said, excuse me. And I said, I just want to acknowledge you for being such a an extraordinary gentleman. I said, I saw the way you treated your lady, how you opened the door, how you pulled the chair out. I said, that's class. I said, my name's Tony, what's yours? And I don't honestly remember his name, Charlie or something. And he looked up at me and I said, Charlie? I said, that's amazing, taking your date out for a lunch like this. He goes, well, actually, she's my mom. <laughs> and I said, that's even more cool. And, I, and he said, oh, but I, I'm not taking her to lunch because I'm just, I think he said he was eight. I said, oh, yes, you are. And I had no plan for this. I just reached in my pocket. I took all the money I had left, 17, 18, 19 dollars, and I put it on the table. I said, you're taking her to lunch. And he looked up at me and he goes, I can't take that. I said, sure you can't. He said, why? Because I'm bigger than you are. <laughs> and he smiled real big and I didn't even look at his mom. I just turned and walked away. And I didn't walk out of that door, I flew home. I should have been freaking out. How the fuck am I gonna eat? But I didn't, I flew because something inside of me had finally got past scarcity. I finally realized there's something inside of us more than our limits, especially around this thing called money that I had let terrorize me. And I got home and the mailman came that day and I had no idea I was gonna have my next meal. And a letter comes and it's from the guy I loaned the money to. A handwritten note saying, I've been avoiding you, it's wrong, I'm so sorry, you were there when I needed you. Here's what I owe you plus a little bit more. And the 1200 was there plus another 100 for the time that I had to take care of it. And for me, $1,300, that was enough to like, run my show for a month or two. And I cried. And then I decided, what does this mean? And I thought, this means that whenever you give, it's always going to come back so you don't have to ever think about that shit again. Just give. And the rewards will be greater than you can ever imagine. I don't know if that's coincidence but I decided to believe that day was a blessing when I became rich. And I can tell you honestly, I've had tough days in my life, economically, emotionally, like all of us, but I've never gone back to that scarcity, I never will. The secret to living is giving. Do it when you don't have it, and I promise you, scarcity will leave your life. Steve's a dear friend of mine, and when he was building the win, I'll never forget, he was at my home in Sun Valley. I'd just gotten to meet him. It was New Year's. And everybody else was standing watching the fireworks. And I was sitting at the table and I was basically doing a brain melt, sucking out of his brain everything I possibly could. How do you think about this? What do you do? How do you market? And here's what I learned from Steve. People don't buy products. 
They buy feelings. People don't buy products, they buy states. People don't buy products, they buy identities. And he and I went back and forth for about two and a half or three hours and became lifelong friends the last decade and a half. He came to this seminar, sat in the front row, and I'm not, there's almost nothing that makes me uncomfortable, but I'm like, what am I gonna teach him? But he sat in this event at lunch, took me to lunch, and he goes, this is the most viable session I've been in the last 10 years. I know what I'm gonna do. This was in 2008. He said, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm going to, when all my competitors are shrinking right now, because they're trying to survive, I'm gonna go build this giant beach club that goes right to Las Vegas Avenue. I'm gonna build this new entrance. I'm gonna up my services. He said, I'm gonna do what you teach. What is the fundamental success to becoming wealthy? It's only one thing. If you wanna be wealthy, you have to do more for your clients than who? Anyone than anyone else. You have to add more what? Value. That is the entire secret to wealth in business. If you want it in one sentence, it's simple. Do more for others than anyone else is doing. Add more value and you will own them and you will own the marketplace. He goes, you know what I'm gonna to do, Tony? I'm gonna, to, when everybody else is shrinking, I'm gonna add more value. So all the high-end people are gonna see I'm doing more and they're gonna to come to me and this down period is gonna be the most important period of my entire career. Because when the economy comes back and those guys start giving services, I already own these people. They're not gonna leave me, I'm their home. You gotta ask yourself, what do I do to add more value? And many of you think adding more value means cutting your prices, or doing something of that nature. Sometimes adding value is raising your price. It's crazy. Raising your price can increase your sales if it's the right piece. Now, if you raise your price and do more, no question that could be the right thing in some cases. Some of you, your market is the cheapest price. Maybe it's time to change that business model because unless you're Walmart or Amazon or somebody that can do things at massive volume and lose money and sustain it, you might need a thing called a margin. If you're gonna be successful in business, you want a high margin. High margins come from high human needs being met. The only way to deal with fear that I found in my life is a couple ways. One of those ways is to turn it on itself and ask yourself, what am I afraid of? If I'm afraid of that, I gotta be more afraid of what I'm gonna miss out on, missing out on my mission, missing out on who I'm supposed to be. Missing. In other words, if you're not getting get rid of fear, then use fear. Use fear or it uses you, it's that simple. So you gotta say, okay, what's the price if I just stay doing this? What's the price? What, I need to really even get scared if I learn all this and I don't fall through. That's something to be scared about. And then that fear will get you over your fear. It'll push you through. Turn fear on itself. Second way you can do it is use what you've probably heard me say because I've used it since I was 17, is my little rocking chair test, right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna sit myself in my rocking chair and I'm, I'm 85 years old and looking back on my life and I say, I didn't do this or I did. When I talk about the art of fulfillment, what I explain to people always is, I didn't say science of fulfillment. Why not? Because it's different for everyone, just like art. What one person thinks is beautiful, somebody else might think is ugly. So if you want to know what's beautiful, as many people there are on earth, it's an art because everyone has a different view. If you want to know what God loves, the universe loves, go to the forest and see it. It's called massive diversity. It isn't a science. It's an art. But that art, unmastered, will create an ugly life. An ugly life. And the phrase I use most often that I hope you've heard me say and you take it in once again maybe deeper is, success without fulfillment is the ultimate failure. Success without fulfillment is the ultimate failure. But if we don't physically make a decision how we're gonna live, then will show up like everybody else because the human mind is not gonna make you happy. This brain of yours won't do it. You have to direct it. And there's no worse fate than to achieve everything and not be fulfilled. How many have had the days where you achieved this huge goal and your brain always wanted it and you got it and then your brain went, is this all there is? Who's been there? It's the worst experience. It's worse than failing, isn't it? Because most of you are achievers, so failure never stops you. You just look at a little bump on the road, I'll try something, what? But when you succeed and you fail, when you succeed and you're not fulfilled, that's scary. If you find your passion, you're gonna have this tremendous energy, it's sustainable energy. 
But momentum requires you always do the next thing to keep the momentum going. And the reason you get yourself in a passionate place is so that you change your life and the only thing that changes your life is making a decision. So while you're in this passionate state, that's where you make decisions. You don't make decisions when you're like, oh, I don't know, what do you think? All right, let's decide. If you make a decision in a state without momentum, if you make a decision from a place where there's no passion, you are not gonna get momentum. It'll kill momentum. It's decide, commit, and resolve. Some of you, in the past, you've gotten momentum, you've gotten passionate, you've even made a decision, but a decision is the first step. Decision is like a war. I gotta do this or that, all right, I'm gonna make myself do this. But commitment is when you now, after you've decided, you commit to do this for the long term. Whether it's hard or easy, doesn't matter. You're doing this. It takes it from this moment and it carries it into the future even when things are difficult. And the third state is resolve. Resolve means it's done. It's like, it doesn't even if you took action, it's done inside you, so it's done out there. There's no question whatsoever. Then once you decide, the only way the commitment and the energy and the momentum continues is if you take immediate, massive what, my friends? Massive what? Write down in your notes, massive action is the cure-all. Massive action is the cure-all. If you're having a difficult time with something, your relationship isn't where you want it to be, your finances are not where you want to be, your body's not where you want to be, your business is not where you want to be, you need to take massive action. And if that doesn't work, try something else. If that doesn't work, try something else. Keep going with massive action and you will find the way because it will give you momentum. Here's the belief I'd like you to try on. I don't need an excuse to feel good. What if I don't need an excuse to feel good? I can just feel good for no good reason. How many like this idea? Say I. Now notice, notice when I first said it, you guys are kind of quiet, processing it. Like, I don't need a reason to feel good? Well, how do I know to feel good? Most people don't need a reason to feel bad. How's it going? Feel like crap. How come? Woke up. In a moment, I like you to celebrate for no good reason, just because you decided to, but I mean really celebrate. So you're gonna rise up. Are you ready? We'll clap. When I yell three, we go crazy. One. Two. Three, go! <laughs> come on! Come on! Come on! Come on! Come on! Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. I'd love to know what did you take from this video? It's kind of impossible not to take something. So what did you take from this video that you're going to immediately apply to your life or to your business? Please leave it down in the comments below. I'm super curious to find out. I also want to give a quick shout out to Jemiah Expose. Thank you so much for picking up a copy of my book, Your One Word. I guess the ebook version of it. I really, really, really appreciate it and hope you are enjoying it. Thank you guys again for watching. I believe in you. I hope you continue to believe in yourself and whatever your one word is. Much love. I'll see you soon.